Okay, greetings of peace, love, and light, and welcome to Raising Sun Rays, where we explore the esoteric in parenting. My name is Robin Ringgold, and I'm your host. Um, our special guest today is Ryan Cropper. Uh, Ryan is one of my mentors, and I'm especially grateful to welcome him to Raising Sun Rays today. Welcome, Ryan. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Ryan is a master astral traveler, spiritual life coach. Um, he has over 125,000 YouTube subscribers and has tons of information and courses on his website, www.ryancropper.com. So welcome, Ryan. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Yes. So um, our topic today is when children see spirits and astral travel. So I really wanted to talk about this um, subject because I wanted to help parents understand what's happening, number one, why it's happening, and what they can do to assist their children. So um, I just want you to start off just talking briefly about your experiences as a child, and I think you had a near-death experience. Um, if you want to just kind of briefly talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'll briefly, briefly touch on it. <laughs> yeah, when I was younger, first off, I chose my parents. I came in fully aware. And um, as, I was a, as I was a toddler, and people were starting to speak to me, uh, trying to teach me English, my ability to become aware or my awareness naturally started to diminish. So I started learning the customs of people here. That was really weird because I was really intelligent inside my head. I was speaking English inside my head. I could understand all the fights that my parents were having, everything, even like stuff that they weren't even aware of about wow. their relationship. And then all of a sudden I went from being this really smart, nonverbal kind of like, you know, tiny baby to waking up in the morning and having blank spots, like not really noticing certain things anymore and being like, what's going on? Like, I swear I was supposed to be thinking about something, you know? And then that was because I was trying to learn English. And the more I was able to learn, the less I was able to remember certain things. And during this process, my abilities were really high, abilities that I've had before that many people come with. And not only that, but I think the physical body is actually prone to having a lot of these abilities anyway, especially when you're younger, before your body's been kind of jabbed up with a bunch of toxins. So I started astral projecting and uh, I didn't know it was astral projection. Okay. I, when I was a kid, uh, I would just see dead people, dead animals. Uh, and I just thought that they were essentially living people. I didn't realize that they were dead. I didn't realize they were in another plane of existence. I would see the astrals over this one. And every now and then I would pop in and out so often that I didn't even know I'd pop down my body. It's like I'd blink and I'd just be there, you know? And wow. there is no me laying down or relaxing or anything like that. And yeah. so for a very long time, let's say about 10 to 13 years, I thought that there was no separation between dimensions and that dead people existed in this world. I didn't even know they were dead. I just thought they were strange. Wow. Um, I had no sense of our house being our house because there would always be strangers walking around. But wow. I realized that those strangers weren't actually um, visible to my parents. They would like stand in front of the TV and I'm trying to watch like the mask of Jim Carrey. <laughs> and I was going to see this woman standing there, but me and my brother. Wow. And um, yeah. So another amnesiatic moment happened when I was about 13. Uh, I became so focused with this life that my abilities turned off and I was so terrified with my abilities most of the time. So I was um, surrounded with a lot of horror movies. My sister, my nan would watch a lot of them. They'd have bookshelves with videotapes with some messed up stuff on there. Yes. We'd watch them. Even though it's now parents try to stop us from watching them. Our uncles would show them to us, our sisters, you know, they would just yeah. let us watch them, all of them. And that influenced what, kind of got attracted to my direction in the astral realm. Okay. Made it kind of scary. And then I suppressed a lot of things. Not only that, but my lifestyle as a kid was kind of messed up outside of the astral realm. I'm talking about domestic abuse, abuse outside of the household on the streets. There were like different gangs or different groups of individuals even 
You know, yeah. across the street, I get bullied by one group of individuals. I go around the corner and there's another group of individuals. I go to my park and there's another group of individuals. They're everywhere, you know? So stress of life, uh, seeing some scary things on uh, in the astrals ended up causing me to suppress a bunch of my memories of these kind of happenings. Then when I was 16, I died. So I went from 13 to 16 without remembering anything. Right. And when I died, I basically drowned in a local quarry, not local to my town, but to another town nearby. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I drowned in the quarry, I basically got to a headspace so similar to death that it triggered a bunch of memories. Wow. And so the, the two weeks after I died, I ended up remembering weird like visions, flashes of, of like fragmented memories, right. stuff like that was pretty cool. And then uh, going off of my memories, I was able to kind of put them all together and put myself in the same headspace that I was in as a kid and deliberately trigger astral projections through wow. memory regression. And then I was able to study my past mind. And then by studying how I thought my like emotional state at the time, I was able to re- do that all over again and figure out what was being triggered inside my, my mind, my body. And then I came up with specific practices that I would do in my downtime to kind of trigger them on purpose. Okay. It ranged from very small things to more abstract things. And I d- I took, it took me about four years to come up with the solid exercise for myself to start popping out my body whenever I wanted to the point where I was like good. Uh, but otherwise two weeks after my death, I had my first astral projection and I didn't even know it was astral projection. It just happened because during the first two weeks I started remembering things and still I didn't really know what it was I was doing. Okay. And then just from re- remembering the memories, I popped up my body two weeks later, experienced what people call source consciousness or light the light you know they'll go into the light yeah and uh, that was pretty groovy i thought that i had teleported physically because it was so realistic right and a smile on my face coming into college telling my brother that i had teleported he didn't believe me it took him a couple of years to believe me at all with all this stuff right but, um, i'd later in life find out that the term was called astral projection i didn't teleport at all that's where I really went into the memories and started, you know, digging out everything and creating my, my methods. Okay. But, yeah. So I'm curious, um, what are some of the other abilities that you were born with that you remember? I was born with, I could see the future, my future. And it wasn't kind of, well, we wouldn't call it seeing your future back then. Like we would just call it the plan you know, it, it's like, because where we're from, there's no such thing as time and space. So it's kind of like, you know how to manipulate the series of events. Okay. And that's set in stone because that's what you choose. You know? And then I would be in the womb and I would remember tweaking my reality and tweaking this series of events whilst I'm in my mom's belly. You know, just like checking up on everything. And I brought that into this reality. Yeah. Wow. So, so let's just talk a little bit about what is astral projection. I mean, I'm sorry, astral traveling. So like what is actually happening? So you said you're popping out of your body. Um, let's just talk about really happening in the, in, with that phenomenon. Yeah, you, you are consciousness. And when you project your consciousness only as astral travel, you have nothing to you. You can do a, a wide array of things when you're like that. Like... Um, you can merge your awareness in other things. That's pretty cool. If you want to get a perspective on how plants think and how the, the weather thinks and how rocks and everything thinks, because everything is thought. It's all a thought construct, but it just keeps going over and over again to, to, to give it shape and form. So if you imagine having your own thoughts and having one thought in loop and that thought's gathering energy and it, that's what's happening. You've got something that's constantly on the loop. And it's very hard to figure out how that thinks when you're not outside of your own head, your own way of thinking. So astral travel helps you understand the kind of fabric of reality in that sense being thought first. 
So what's the difference between that and the astral projection? Astral projection is when you project with your astral body because you have many bodies kind of intermingled onto each other. They're laid on, like not just on top, they, they, they kind of rely on each other in order to exist, kind of like these dimensions. And the astral body, when you take that with you, you go to astral realms, realms that are more, more uh, real in the sense that they closely resemble these ones. But if you want to get to the higher, higher ones, you kind of need to just escape with your mind, astral travel, as opposed to astral projection. Okay. But everyone wants the astral projection nowadays because it looks more pretty. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, so like I do some shamanic journey. So do you feel like that's a form of astral projection? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so let's just talk about these children being born and, you know, having these imaginary friends. I mean, I've heard stories like, oh, my daughter is there playing with, um, you know, she tells me all of a sudden, oh, mommy, there's a person here that wants to, you know, talk to me. Or, you know, they have, they have sleep paralysis. Let's also talk about sleep paralysis. So first off, let's just talk about like children. First off, some of them are scared. And it sounds like you, like when you were younger, it was just kind of normal because you saw it all the time. It didn't necessarily scare you until you started interjecting like, you know, the horror films and the, the beliefs and thoughts of our society, of consciousness. Um, so for children that are seeing these things and, you know, first off are afraid or even they feel like it's a normal part of life, um, why are children so susceptible to seeing these things? Oh, that's because they're still pretty much dead. <laughs> They've just been birthed into the world. So it's like they're really like not involved into this reality for a long time because they've just crossed over into this reality. Right. So they're very much still a part of the other worlds. Right. Yeah. yeah, I read something about them. Um, their electromagnetic spectrum is still is, is different than ours. And so they're able to see things that we aren't. And if ours were, were like that, we'd be able to see all these things too. Yeah, it should be. Just it should be different because growing up, you know, ours gets compromised quite a bit. The older generation, right. what you eat makes a massive impact as well. Right. So what you eat, what you watch, what you what you think, what yeah. you're taught. Your yeah. body, your body is like a, a a memory card of all of the emotional stress in your body, and it essentially your thoughts, your experiences cause you to think a certain way that causes your heart to tighten up your lungs to tighten up your stomach to go out of whack your adrenals to go out of whack and if you cannot completely relax all the way through then your organs aren't working properly so the uh, signals are all messed up wow yeah. which is the case with most people right <laughs> um so okay so children have just kind of left that realm so they're still kind of fresh so what about, what about children that are like terrified of seeing like, you know, these, these spirits or people um, of having people visit them at night? Um, what would you say to a parent whose child comes running in their bedroom at night? Like, you know, mommy, is somebody in my, in my bedroom? Yeah, keep them in your room if they're saying that. Don't tell them to go back into their room. That's <laughs> the worst thing you can do to a kid. And even if you can't believe what they're saying, at least keep an open mind to the fact that you may not know everything about what they're going through. Because if you say you know what they're going through and you say, oh, it's okay, just come in here anyway, you'll go away. Kids are going to sense that off you. They're going to know you don't really believe them because kids are really intelligent. You know, yeah. So it's better just to say the truth. It's better to say that you don't know what they're seeing. But um, you've heard of some stories and this is where you can go for help. And that's if you don't believe in what they're saying anyway, if you're a skeptical parent. Because there's nothing worse than not having someone around you that doesn't understand or, or not having someone around you that doesn't believe in you, basically. Um, but if you do believe in your children, then, like I said, keep them in your room, possibly even move them to a different room. Look into ways of clearing your children's room. If your child is seeing things, then it's and it, that, that are scaring the child. It's most likely not to do with the child's energy. It's probably your own or someone else in the house. I cannot uh, 
stress that enough because the amount of times I used to project and go into my parents' room and see something messed up was all most of the time. It got to a point where I would just avoid going into anyone's room. Wow. So so how how does one tell the difference between like a benevolent light spirit versus you know something dark that is that could potentially do harm? It's, this is, it happens in the same way that you're able to tell if a human is lying or not here. You can kind of sense it. Well, if you're in the astrals, let's say sensing people lying in 3D is at like a 1% you know, vibe rate. If you're in the astral realm, that's going to go shooting up to like 100 or 110. There's, there's no way someone can lie to you or put off a certain or pull off a certain storyline saying that they're here to help you and stuff like that and set it with a straight face. You know, you're going to feel that the person is lying. And if they're lying, it's going to be a very uncomfortable feeling because the uncomfortability is coming from them. So you, you wouldn't trust them. You can just walk away or tell them to go away. It's the same with negative entities who aren't even saying anything to you. You can just feel their vibes. Right. It's kind of like going back to here. You can feel when someone's negative. When you know you're walking on the street and you want to cross over, it's the same in the astrals, but to a much higher extent and or a louder extent. Same thing, just cross the street. I've done it a few times in the astral realm. It's like, okay, not going in that house. Let's just go in the next house. Right. It's quite easy. So, to right. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Like, so why do the spirits? Why? Why do they come? Like how? Like, how do they feel free to come into my house versus someone else's house or bedroom or like what draws them? I guess I should ask. Energy. Yeah. Because they have no the concept of personal space. It's all energy. So if you're putting off a certain vibe and they're interested, they're going to walk straight through your wall. They're going to come through the door. They're just going to materialize sometimes. So then why would they be interested in a child? Well, they can be seen, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's good company. Not only that, but, you know, if you, if you imagine being a ghost and not being able to be noticed for like years and then all of a sudden the kid can see you, you're going to hang around that kid for quite a while. And uh, more on that point, they've got a lot of energy, like a lot of energy. They're like stars. So if they're scared, it's good to feed off of. That makes the entity stronger or the person stronger. And it, it gives the, the being more of a sense of, I guess, reality in terms of them feeling real. So, okay, is there a difference between, so I've heard of stories that people when they pass over or die, um, that they don't fully make it back to the light. So they kind of hang out. So you're saying no? Oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, oh. yeah, I'm pretty much oh, okay. they, they, don't, they don't go all the way back. Right, okay, so they don't go all the way back. Um, are, there, are those the people that the children are seeing? Are those the spirits that, that we're seeing? Yeah, yeah. Not unless the child is projecting into another reality. Otherwise, it will be them seeing into the etheric plane, which is where these souls are. Okay. Okay, so back to I'm a parent and my child is, um, you know, running in my bedroom saying that there's something in, in their room. So what ways or what methods could I use to get rid of this spirit? Well, it would help if you could actually project. So you probably have to learn that. <laughs> All right, Ryan, well, most parents probably that are going to watch this probably are not astral projectors themselves. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool, you know, just to burst into their room, kick the door down, <laughs> scan the place. But otherwise, um, hmm, other than what I've said, I'm trying to think of. Like, like the, the traditional, like, sage and, like, salt, you know, like the salt in, like, bowls and, you know. Salt works. Salt works. Yeah, salt water. Right. That works, sure. keeping it near uh, windows and lights, night lights. Make sure they don't go out as well. And, and don't close your kid's door. Leave, a pass leave the light on in the passage. As soon as you close that door, the kid's going to freak out. 
you know, and uh, so electricity stops beings from showing up. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, That's very interesting. Even if they materialize in the kid's room, like, like I said, the kid can see the being and the parents can't, but if the parent just left the light on, then the being can't materialize to the extent where the child can see it. It completely messes it up. I think that's because of the magnetic waves, the electromagnetic waves dealing with the uh, electricity under the walls and under the floors and everything. Another thing you can do is, hmm, I would say get a pet. Some beings don't like pets like cats, but that can have a negative effect on the child. If the child sees the cat like staring into the corner of the room, it can freak out the kid. So, um, maybe not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think that's a great idea, though. A bird, perhaps, probably be better. Or some kind of gerbil or hamster. Just something that has a different frequency from the uh, being, person or otherwise. Because as soon as a kid wakes up and there's like a gerbil in his room or her room, in a cage, they're going to empathically feel that gerbil. It's going to feel different. It's going to feel nicer than what they're used to waking up feeling in their in their room you know okay. it's kind of like just mess like changing it up a little bit the energy in the room okay wow incredible um so let's talk a little bit about like sleep paralysis um so i know a lot of people have that feeling and it terrifies them like you know when they wake up and they can't move so can you just talk a little bit about what's happening when they experience that yeah the rational body is not working properly Oh, wow. They've got some energy centers that are open, causing them to slip in and out of dimensions or even seeing things or even hearing things, but they're not fully developed yet to get up. And sometimes you can have uh, beings that want to take you out of your body and they'll know that you're partially in and out. And so they'll want to help you get out of your body. They'll do this by pulling your covers off your bed. You get that a lot. If you watch a lot of movies, it's going to terrify you. But if you don't watch a lot of movies, then you'll realize that they're just doing it for your benefit. Just to get your attention. Once you get up, they'll disappear. They'll knock on the wall. They'll turn on your TV. You know, they'll like whisper in your ear or they'll say your name or something. If they're really nice, then they'll step outside of the room first and make some noise outside of the room, knocking on the door and stuff like that just to get your attention or, or kind of moving the doorknob a little bit. That's a bit too creepy because some of these beings know what's going to scare you. So sometimes they'll be nice, you know, they won't just come in and start talking to you right in your face. But uh, yeah, it's because they're not ready to project yet. There are energies though in the astrals that are really dense, really heavy, which can stop you from getting up. Yeah, I liken it to the force out of Star Wars. Wow. And there are beings that can also project that force and stop you from getting out of your body. So it feels like you, you've got like water on you, like a whole kind of ocean on top of your body. So it's interesting. I always thought that sleep paralysis happened because you wake <clears> up <throat> and your astral body returns. So is that not the case? You wake up, but your astral body returns. Like, so you're astral traveling out there or astral projecting, I guess. And you're waking up, but your astral body is not back in your physical body yet. And that's why you can't move until it's fully like integrated again. Hmm. I haven't <laughs> experienced it like that. Um, okay. I mean, that could not be true. I just, I remember it maybe reading that or thinking that even, so I'm not sure. So what about the vibration or the shaking of the bed? I've heard people, um, even parents saying that their children said their bed was shaking or they started like vibrating. So what, what are those phenomena? The vibrations are coming from the kid. They're not coming from something shaking the bed. Yeah. I only figured that out because I had the same problem. I used to tell my mom the bed was shaking. I used to freak out thinking it was someone shaking the bed. And then I'll go downstairs and I'll sleep in my younger brother's bunk at the bottom of his, his, his bunk bed and the bed will start shaking again. And then I realized it would shake based on my energy. If my energy was higher, it would shake faster. I learned how to slow down my breathing and slow down my energy, and then the bed will stop shaking. 
So it's wow. coming from the kids. Wow. Um, so the other thing I was thinking about um, a few weeks ago, now that a lot of people are starting to wake up and share their stories, um, I keep hearing stories about people that saw spirits, that talked to ghosts, that had all of these, you know, phenomena happening as they were growing up, but no one ever believed them. People told them they were lying and it just damaged them so much. So my, my, the real message that I really wanted to get across to parents is that you may not understand there's a whole nother world that exists that perhaps you haven't been privy to that your child might experience. Um, and so I, I really want to like really get that message out that we really have to start supporting our children because they're being born with abilities and um, experiences that, you know, we've been typically terrified of. Um, could you just talk a little bit more about like, your, you know, your mom's responses when you were younger and like, you know, the support that maybe you felt like you could have benefited from at that age? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of goes back into what I was going to say. Um, most people won't believe in their kids because they're in resistance to their own memories as a kid. You know, maybe they had experiences that were weird and they blocked them and they can't quite remember, but now they've got this weird, like allergic reaction to anything supernatural. And the similar thing happened to my mom. She would tell me a bunch of stuff that happened to her, but she would just tell me the things that terrified her. And then she wouldn't go all the way into her stories. Like she would stop at some point, you know, it's, it's just, it's a fear really. Wow. Um, so I wanted to talk, I had a really interesting experience as a child. So I used to fly and I used to fly down the steps and into my dining room and kind of like circle. And I used to tell my mom and my sister, like, I'm telling you guys, I used to fly and I could feel like the butterflies in my stomach. And um, it was very real, but no one ever believed me. And just this year, I started understanding that after some healing work, some serious healing work, I started understanding that it was a fractal of myself that broke off due to trauma. And it was kind of like, you know, she was like separate from me. So I was like having that experience, but I didn't understand it and no one ever believed me. And so I just wanted to talk, is, are there other experiences besides just the astral travel or seeing like ghosts or spirits? Um, what other experiences did you have as a child that, you know, might fit into that category of someone not believing you? Someone not believing me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I didn't tell anyone when I was a kid. I was quite so sorry. what about being able to see the future, though? Did you see things that maybe scared you or? No. 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 Whenever I saw the future, what people would call uncomfortable situations, I, have, I had like an understanding of the situations that they're not really scary and they're there to help. And it wasn't really something that would bother me at all, you know? Wow. But um, yeah, people, I just didn't tell people. Wow. I told my mom, but that wasn't for long. Really, it was just me and my brothers that were talking about it a lot. And uh, my friends used to come over. I'd tell them I used to see ghosts. I wouldn't tell them I would astral project. But my friends, I'd say they were ghosts. And then my house was known to be haunted. So they'd sleep over. And weird things would happen and they'd end up running out in the middle of the night. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. So let's talk a little bit about um, deceased relatives. So a lot of children have experiences, um, you know, of their say grandparents when they pass, you know, seeing their grandmother or grandfather or, um, so why do you think that happens um, more regularly with kids? Hmm. I think when someone passes on, they end up returning back to the house because they don't know they're dead or it's just, it's a familiar place for their subconscious mind to kind of link their soul to. And obviously, if there's children in the house, then they're going to see grandpa much more often than their mom and dad. You know, they're going to notice them. And some of the time, the parents or the parents' parents, <laughs> you know, they, they will start having conversations with people who are standing there trying to get a response because they don't know they're dead. 
and then they'll turn and speak to like Jack and the kid, Jack will just be like, oh, hi, grandma, you know, and then it'll freak out everyone else in the room. So yeah, and that, and plus I, I think by now, the older generation who are passing on, they know that kids are more open to seeing dead people. So like if I was really old, like in my nineties and I looked really old and I passed on, I would definitely start contacting uh, my nieces and nephews first for anyone else because they're more likely to see me actually not a couple of them that would see me right. so, so yeah. do, you, do you feel like um so like i have a few friends that i know of um and we've had conversations about assisting some of these souls to move back to the light so do you feel like um so a parent who is a little more um knowledgeable about these topics do you feel like, um, or could you give some guidance to their parent? Like, so if my child said that, mine are a little older now, but if they were to tell me now, I mean, I might be more apt to say, okay, let's, let's, let's help this spirit back to the light. Hmm. Um, how would they? Hmm. I'm not quite sure how a, a group of people who don't know how to already astral project are going to help as a being to pass on because you can talk to it. You can encourage the child who's really open to speak to it and to say it's okay and stuff like that. And that could help. But um, the child's young with the ability to, or he might not know how to discern certain spirits. So you wouldn't really want to influence the child into speaking to everything that it sees. And uh, from my experience, I've only been able to help people pass on when I'm in the astral realm with the additional experience of knowing what beings are good and what beings are bad. So perhaps if you're in that position, contact someone who has some kind of skill in order to help them pass on. A lot of people use religion. I've not seen that work, but I've heard of it working, you know. So what other types of people would a parent look for to help? So say, say like the cleansing and the salt and the, you know, nightlight, say that didn't work and there's still something in the house that's scaring the heck out of the family. Like who, who would they call? Who would they look up to come? Ghostbusters. <laughs> would you say Ghostbusters? <laughs> uh, a medium? You can contact a medium because they have a direct line of communication with them. Any being out there who has a skill, you can directly contact them, even a telepath or someone who astral projects, you know, one of those three and probably even more. You just need to have a direct line of communication with the being. The person who has that direct line needs to be experienced enough to tell if it's good or bad. You know, you don't want to entertain the wrong kind. And that's it really. I mean, it's either that or you can learn how to do it yourself. Probably take a little while, but <laughs> in a little while, like a week, depending on your mindset. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about the movie The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis. Do you remember that when the little boy was seeing the spirits? Hmm. They were to him. Do you feel like that's kind of what children see? Do you remember the movie? Yeah. Okay. So, do you kind of do you think that that's that's a realistic? Um, um no i don't think it's realistic because it's too real like the whole time you think his dad is for those of you who haven't seen it <laughs> <laughs> well it's old now so we can talk about it <laughs> you think he's not a ghost like you think he's human because he's got glow to his skin and stuff like that and right. he really act like a ghost there were a couple of movies though growing up which were really realistic i found uh, werewolf in london uh-huh. um, and the movie ghost with the pottery the clay yes yes those two were quite realistic okay awesome awesome so um just kind of to like wrap up um I, I really want to address the fear part of it um what can you tell parents like about not being afraid of, of this type of phenomena Hmm, not being afraid. Well, the, the odds of something bad happening is very slim. 
Hmm. I mean, even if there is something around that's uncomfortable, it's not going to go crazy like you'd see in movies, you know, like throwing things across the room and possessions and stuff like that. That kind of thing hardly happens, if any. Like, it's very rare. You probably have to go to some town where a mass massacre has happened or something where the energy is really bad and you have to be in a specific area of the world where the veils are incredibly thin and it would have to be like a huge influence there. it's very unlikely that's just going to happen to your kid or to the space you're in so there isn't really much of a cause to freak out um, you know there's, there's no need to freak <laughs> uh, but I guess try your hardest to stop your mind from going insane, like crazy thinking about thoughts of what could be happening. Cause fear is like fire. Once it starts, it just goes crazy and burns everything down. And that's, it's like that in the mind. So instead of jumping to conclusions and kind of having a huge list of movies in your head and you're trying to understand your child through your movies uh, genre, just kind of take a breath and just listen to what's being said and actually listen without trying to figure anything out. That's proper listening. And then um, from there, kind of learn from what he or she is saying and what's happening and use that as, as material, you know, rather than all the other stories you've heard about online, about hauntings and stuff like that. Right. Um, so why do you think that um, more children are being born kind of awake, as you said, um, in these recent years? Hmm. The earth. <laughs> the earth and especially the solar system. Every planet is aware of every planet and people are having a huge effect as well. Even people in neighboring dimensions having a huge effect on other dimensions. It's the energy is just becoming much more. What's the word? Hmm. I wouldn't say clean. It's louder mm -hmm. and it's easier to access. Because someone actually mentioned this the other day that perhaps the energy has always been here, but people were just too dense. You know, right. And I think it took a while for people to kind of shake out their density, and the energy to start to really impact them. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm you know I'm really grateful to you for joining us today, and hopefully this has helped um, some of the parents that are experiencing some of these um, phenomena with their children. Um, and I just want to point um, our listeners to your website at ryancropper.com. Because if you are interested in astral traveling or astral projection or some of the other wonderful um, courses that you have online, or even your YouTube videos, which cover a lot of topics besides um, just astral travel or astral projection, um, I definitely highly recommend your videos, especially all of the awesome food ones and dry fasting and mm -hmm. those others that really um, influenced me. So I just wanted to thank you. Do you want to say anything before we wrap up? Hmm. Um, let's see anything other than what you've already said? <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry. I did think of one topic that we kind of just, I wanted to touch on. What okay. about like protecting and shielding yourself before you go to bed at night? Mm. We didn't talk about that. And I just want to address that. <clears throat> that helps. Really protecting means it's it's best if you get rid of the thing or the problem that you have, the conflict, internal conflict, before you go to sleep. Never go to bed with a crazy mind or crazy energetic body. You want to have some kind of meditation just to settle all your thoughts. Don't be thinking about tomorrow when you're trying to sleep. It's not going to help you sleep at all. And when you go to bed calm and empty like that, nothing can pick up on your frequency as bad. And you carry that into your room. You know, you'll probably start changing your room around, cleaning it up a little bit because you're just clear. And you'll go to bed so peaceful, you'll have great dreams. And then you actually have to sleep a lot less. I've noticed you'll cut your sleeping time straight in half, if not even, even more than that. Wow. So that would be good just to kind of 
repel anything around you that's negative. Nothing likes a good, clean, pure soul sleeping really soundly at all. It's, it's really uncomfortable for negative beings. But other than that, I'd say a, a good shower before bed will get you closer to an, an energetical frequency where you're not harboring anything because the water will help clear you mm -hmm. before bed. And... Hmm. What about crystals? Yeah, crystals. Crystals tend to wake you up, though. Energetic. You ain't going to get much sleep if you have like an amethyst next to your head. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to start seeing visions, hearing voices, and projecting and stuff like that. They tend to amplify. But then again, saying that, there are some stones you can get which will help. More earthy stones. If you build a grid in your room, which isn't very difficult, you just go by feng shui and what feels right, you know? Yes. Then these stones will help create a better harmonic in the room, an energetical balance in the room, you know? That will help quite a bit. And again, it stops things from shifting into your space when the whole space is already stuck at a certain frequency. Okay. So earthy stones like jaspers and those kinds of, okay. Jaspers, iron. Uh, you see that in movies a lot, the iron and the coast. But you want to get to more to the, the earthy stones and put those around your room. Yeah, they're nice. Awesome. Okay, well, I think that about wraps it up. And once again, I just wanted to thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And um, please look us up on uh, Raising Sunrays on YouTube and like and subscribe. And I'll put all of Ryan's links in the information section of the video. So thank you. And I will be seeing you soon. Yes. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Bye.